to the Lubbers Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Ian. And with Mike. And this week, just like every other week, we are rereading our favourite series of novels, the Aubrey Matra novels of Patrick O'Brien. Mike, we're still early in a new book, right? Help us catch up with where we were, would you? And where might we be headed to this week? Oh, thanks, Ian. I'd love to. Last week... In chapter one of the Commodore, we had the whole crew on the journey back home, finally coming back to England. We learned that Jack had won the Baltimore Clipper Ringle from Henage Dundas in a lucky backgammon game. Stephen received orders to go straight to London, despite all his worries about you know what the years may have done to he and Diana's relationship. Yeah. Jack heard that he might become a Commodore in a letter from Lord Melville to Henage. Stephen went ahead to London on the Ringle, and Jack came into a deserted Shelmerston and then arrived home at an almost deserted Ashgrove Cottage. Riding to see his family at Wilcombe, we left him in the darkness when he fell from his horse and struck his head on a rock. So a little bit of a, mm, you know, wait a minute, <laughs> what's going on here? This time, Jack has some good news to offset his injury. Stephen sees Sir Joseph and meets with the Intelligence Committee. Mrs. Williams is back and on steroids. There's some interesting Easter eggs, as always, a new post-captain, historical footnotes, and schadenfreude galore. Will Stephen finally get to see Diana and Bridget? Only time will tell. Fantastic, Mike. Let's get straight into it. Besides all the other assignations and meetings there are going to be, Stephen's got to get straight to the Admiralty. He's got to get with Sir Joseph Blaine. Blaine is pale and harried when Stephen arrives at the Admiralty. They are, of course, delighted to see each other. Sir Joseph is especially delighted with Stephen's memory and his generosity, handing Joseph uh, a, a upator in gens wrapped in a dirty handkerchief. This is the beetle that Sir Joseph had asked Stephen for way back at the beginning of the voyage. So now he says, at last I am the possessor of the noblest beetle in creation. So well done, Stephen. Well done, Patrick O'Brien as well. He's reached all the way back to what, Mike? Chapter nine, Nutmeg of Consolation. Stephen had uh, had this note from Sir Joseph saying, couldn't move your money. Glad to hear your fortune is intact. And if you happen to come across this beetle, please think of me. And we might want to check in with our resident natural philosopher, James Albright, to check in with what kind of beetle Eupator might be. We guessed that it might be a rhinoceros beetle. Maybe, maybe not. So, James, if you're listening, give us a quick shout out on socials. Anybody else who wants to jump in on what might Eupator ingens genuinely be all about, let us know. Meanwhile, it's good enough for Sir Joseph. He's amazed to receive it, amazed even that Stephen can bear to part with it. So, Mike, we, we've got the social preliminaries here underway between Stephen and Sir Joseph. Now we've got to get down to business, right? Right. Well, you know, the committee is arriving in another room, the intelligence committee, right? And and Sir Joseph stops Stephen before they go in and says he needs to speak to him in his role as a public servant. And he tells Stephen on behalf of the First Lord that Captain Aubrey text says, is to hoist a broad pennant and cruise off the west coast of Africa to protect our merchantmen Ooh. and to discourage the slave trade. Now, Aubrey is going to need an eminent surgeon, a linguist, and a man steeped in political intelligence. And they, that is the First Lord and Sir Joseph, were hoping that these might all be found in the same amiable person. Obviously, there's only yeah. one of those that we know of, right? And that's <laughs> Stephen here. But Sir Joseph says, first, he has to ask Stephen a question. And it's a question, he says, that he, he wants to make sure that this decision will not place Stephen in a painful state of indecision and reserve. And the question is, where would Stephen's heart lie if the French intended to descend on Ireland? And Stephen jumps in immediately, says, well, you know, there's no indecision at all. Why, he'd do everything he could to sink, burn, or destroy them. He doesn't want the French with their present horrible system in Ireland any more than he wants them in the rest of the world here. He does say to Sir Joseph, because Sir Joseph and he are not exactly aligned on everything, that, as he said many times, he believes that nations should govern themselves, even though he reflects the Irish may not be very good at it. <laughs> but he sums it up to say, and the text reads, 
My own house may be unswept in places, but is my own, and I will thank no stranger for putting it in order, least of all if he is an ugly, false, impish thief of a black Corsican. So Sir Joseph, <laughs> needless to say, is delighted to hear that, and they walk in to address the committee. Yeah, and this is a committee that's particularly happy. Uh, they're happy to hear of all of the exploits that Stephen's been up to. We get this nice little bit of a retroactive exposition for all of us who can't remember quite what happened in the last two books. The committee is pleased, especially that all the gold and the drafts and the treasury bills that Stephen had taken with him are still unspent and available for other purposes right now. And maybe, Mike, we're just getting a little reminder here that this desire to go do something in Chile and in South America is still there, the resources are still there, and maybe, maybe we'll come back to it at some point. I don't know. But right after the meeting, Sir Joseph asks Stephen this really odd favour, and Mike, it's, it's kind of bizarre to think about how, how this came to be and what the connections might be behind it, but Sir Joseph says, can you carry a statue with you when you go back to Shelmerston along with Captain Pullings? Stephen says that, well, he plans to, to go by coach to post straight down to Barham and to see Diana. And he asks how much this statue weighs. Three tons, comes the answer. And Stephen says, well, we could take it in the Ringle. We could take it in the boat as long as Tom approves. He says he's going to go ask Tom Pullings after he's visited Mrs. Broad at the Grapes. He's going to take Sarah and Emily. So they make this appointment to meet at the club for dinner afterward. But Mike, I, I was really happy to see Stephen mentioning Mrs. Broad and the grapes. And I'm very happy that he goes straight there. You know, before we spend any more time in London, we're back to Mrs. Broad and the grapes. Mrs. Broad has known Stephen for so long. She's such a good friend. She's had far stranger requests from him than to look after and give, give home places, if you like, to the girls. Doesn't mind them at all. She says, however black and popish they might be. Lord bless you, Doctor. They will be happy enough here, she says. We have every colour in the liberties, black, grey, brown and yellow, everything except perhaps bright blue, and they can run about in the churchyard or watch the traffic in the Strand. And I, I don't know quite what she imagines Sarah and Emily are going to do standing on street corners in the Strand, but never mind. She moves on to ask about Mrs. Maturin, about Diana, and about their daughter Bridget. And Stephen says he doesn't know anything yet. He's come straight to London. He plans to go and see them next day. Ah, well, at dinner that evening, Stephen tells Sir Joseph that Tom is happy to carry the statute if they can get it aboard before the turn of the tide. And Sir Joseph says, you know, that's really no problem since it's already in Somerset House and can be carried by barge there on the Thames. Then we get this great bit of Patrick O'Brien period dialect like Paul Briars was talking about last week. Stephen, Sir Joseph says, ain't you clemmed? This nor'easter makes me so hungry that I should be pettish if it were anyone but you. I am of your way of thinking entirely, says Stephen. Let us go up at once. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Now, Mike, nothing is ever an accident. Nothing is ever inconsequential. This mention of Somerset House, like I, I can remember Somerset House from my, from my youth being the place where you went to get copies of birth, marriage and death certificates. But what might be the reason why Patrick O'Brien's dropped Somerset House in here at this point? It, I had exactly the same question. I fell deep down a rabbit hole. So I'm, I'm, you know, hopefully oh, let me great. condense this a little bit here. But it's because it's fascinating history. So Edward Seymour, you remember Jane Seymour, who married King Henry oh, yeah. VIII. Edward Seymour becomes Duke of Somerset and Lord Protector in 1547, you know, when his young nephew, King Edward VI, takes the crown. In 1549, he starts building this house, but is stripped of all his titles and executed in the Tower of London in 1552. So this thing goes through lots of different uses. Parliament actually tried to sell it off during the Civil War. Uh, they couldn't, so they use it to have Oliver Cromwell's body lay in state in 1658. We remember back kind of visiting the Popish plot and, and supposedly Somerset House was this place where this mysterious murder of a prominent English magistrate, Sir Christopher Wren, all right, boom, we all know Wren, actually restores it 1685. But after the Glorious Revolution, it really starts to decline rapidly and it's going to be demolished in 1775 before Sir William Chambers is appointed 
and is, you know, he spends like the next two decades, essentially the rest of his life, restoring it to be this incredibly great public building. But still, fascinating history. Why are we hearing about it? Well, by 1780, it houses the Royal Academy, the Royal Society, the Society of Antiquities. So we've got great art, architecture, sciences, ah. history. Yeah, in 1789, yeah. the Navy Board moves into this, you know, they had these grand riverside rooms, no highway then, right on the Thames. And the Vittling Commission, the Sick and Hurt Commissioners, the Navy Pay Office, the Treasurer of the Navy, and the Admiralty Museum, precursor to the National Maritime Museum, who we've talked to, Ian, you went to visit here. So, yeah. you know, we've got all of this resonance with the books. And then we recall, wait, this is where all those midshipmen were running off to all the time because this is where the examinations for promotion to lieutenant happened every year. So it's a great setting, a great place on the Thames at that time for Sir Joseph to have his statue. It does make sense. It does tie in. Patrick O'Brien, you're amazing. Ah, fantastic. Good. So uh, still it's a slightly odd, out-of-place idea that Sir Joseph is asking for kind of free or complimentary transportation for this statue, but off we go. It's going to get taken from Somerset House down the Thames, and it's going to get taken along the coast there. As all this is going on, Stephen and Sir Joseph are eating and chatting there in the club. Stephen tells Blaine this story about looking for a place for Sarah and Emily, who he's he'd found in this South Sea island, and he wants them to grow up understanding how a house is run, but not as servants. He wants them to have dowries. And this reminds Sir Joseph of his and Stephen's good luck in accidentally protecting Stephen's fortune from the collapse of a bank. Stephen continues about the girls' dowries. He says, well, reasonable dowries then, in case they choose to marry rather than lead apes in hell. To marry perhaps some skilled and thinking artisan, a clockmaker, for example, or one that makes scientific instruments, possibly an apothecary or a surgeon, or a preparer of specimens for anatomy classes. Catholic, of course, certainly not a sailor. A sailor who may be absent for years throws impossible strains on his wife. And I'm pretty sure he's thinking not only of Jack Aubrey, but also now of himself as he's thinking about the strains. Right. But Mike, let's just wind the tape back a second. Um, leading apes into hell. I remember just reading straight past this the first time I read the book. But this is a reference to something very particular and really interesting in literature, right? Yeah, it's funny because you know I'm 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 out working in the barn and I hear Patrick Tall say this phrase and I went, "What?" And I'm thinking, surely I heard that wrong. So I you know run in, check my Kindle, and he said, "You know, lead apes into hell. What in the world is that?" Well. I've read a lot of references now going back, seen, you know, watch the engram and look behind that. And it's interesting, you know, first references somewhere around 1539. It's in poems, letters to gentlemen's magazines. Shakespeare picks it up. And there's a number of different thinking, you know, no, no absolute agreement on where the phrase comes from. And even Shakespeare uses it kind of in, in two different fashions a little bit here. The wiki dictionary, wiktionary, you know, says an old maid's punishment after death for neglecting to increase and multiply was said to be the leading of apes in hell. So, oh. you know, if you if you didn't increase and multiply, you know, you're going to go to hell and lead apes. And I'm still thinking still makes no sense whatsoever, but <laughs> uh, apparently is a phrase you use. So Taming of the Shrew, Act 2, Scene 1, Katerina, the older sister, you know, says something like, and... For your love to her, lead apes in hell, insert I will, yeah. because you're letting my younger sister marry first because you love her and I'm going to be this old maid. You know, I'm going to have to lead apes in hell. I'll die a maid if you will. In Much Ado About Nothing, Beatrice takes issue with his belief, saying that though she'll be sent to hell for being a maid, the devil will send her straight up to heaven and St. Peter will seat her with the bachelors and they will live as merry as the day is long. So here, yeah. you know, we've got this thing going, no, no, no. Leading apes in hell is not a bad thing. God will not punish me for that. And maybe this is Shakespeare's thinking here. Well, I came across the other major train of thought is W.H. Jansen in his books, Apes and Ape Lore in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. I'm thinking, wow. who writes a topic like that? But, you know, <laughs> hey, all right, let's see. Mr. Jansen, what do you say here? 
He argues that in by that time, the ape is well known as a symbol for fornication. So by refusing to marry, he argues, you know, these women refusing to marry, men are forced to seek sex outside of marriage, making them fornicators, i.e. apes. So the belief was that old maids, in his words, by refusing to marry, are leading otherwise good men into hell, you know, led by their sins here. Now, I'd say that's some world-class mansplaining and a justification yeah. <laughs> that ranks right up there in my mind with Adam's famous, don't look at me, God, she's the one that gave me the apple, right? <laughs> uh, I just, so anyways, regardless of the logic, I think Stephen is simply saying that here he wants to provide dowries unless the girls choose not to marry. But it's just not a phrase that would have meant that to us necessarily. Uh. <laughs> Fantastic. So uh, having taken care of the possibility of marriage or spinsterhood, he goes on to explain in a little bit more detail then why a woman, if she's going to marry anybody, shouldn't marry a sailor. And again, Mike, I think he's clearly talking here about his own marriage to Diana. He talks about how sailors are absent for many years. For the woman, if she is a woman of any degree of temperament at all, he says, that leads to the question of chastity. And after running the house for so many years, she then will have a hard time renouncing authority to her husband when he finally comes back from the sea. Stephen says she probably wouldn't turn it back over since, as he says, men are not invariably born with innate financial wisdom. Who could he be thinking of? And those who have spent most of their time at sea may be far less well acquainted with business by land than a sensible woman. Exhibit one for the jury here, ladies and gentlemen, Sophie Aubrey. (laughs) Stephen goes on. Then again, there is the bringing up of children. And here his voice kind of tails off. He realizes that Sir Joseph's mind is thoroughly on his dinner. But perhaps something is bothering him from the Admiralty. And he goes quiet. And now we get Sir Joseph's perspective on this whole marrying situation he's pretty down on it he says there's little to be said for marrying at all as he says as for the perpetuation of the human race there are times when it seems to me that the world would be far far better if the race were to die out we have made such a sorry piece of work of it everything for happiness and misery everywhere Mm. and mike that, that sounds like a 21st century lament but this is sir joseph blaine and there's nothing that new under the sun. Um, and we've been worrying about our, our conduct as a race since well before Joseph Blaine sat over dinner with Stephen having these thoughts here. And despite the excellent meal, despite the wine, and despite Stephen's company, Joseph Blaine is still down in his spirits. He says he speaks as a bachelor, realizing that Stephen is married, and reminds him that Stephen has not yet had time to go and see his family and is now delayed more in delivering this statue on behalf of Sir Joseph, what he calls an inhumane delay. And Sir Joseph asks if Stephen then has any news of Diana or of Mrs. Oakes. And there's a very, very downbeat close to this little exchange here. I have not, replied Stephen, wondering a little at Blaine's emphasis. And Blaine suggests that they take their, their next part of the conversation in the library, away from the dinner table. And he's the, the emphasis is on Mrs. Oakes and possibly also on Diana here. And that, that makes us wonder a few things, right, Mike? Yeah, this whole, we're, we've been wondering the whole time, kind of, what is this prophecy, Jove? What is this statue? Who is Sir Joseph sending it to? Who is this friend? And is Sir Joseph's emphasis on Clarissa Oakes? Is there some interest yeah. there? Is yeah. it on Diana. We know last time he knew about Diana and the balloon and a lot of stuff that was going on. Does he know something this time? And he thinks that yeah. Stephen doesn't know. I don't know. Really kind of big question marks, a lot of ambiguity here. Right. And like you say, Mike, this this, this statue is made of this stone called porphyry. You and I have both looked for reasons why a statue of Jove made of porphyry might have some resonance or reference. We can't find one, except that it would be a pretty rare thing. So who knows? And who knows whether he's emphasizing Clarissa because he prizes her as an intelligence agent or whether he sees her as a subject of, of, of sexual desire on his part. And I don't think we know. Is he perhaps trying to point us to Porphyry, the Neoplatonic philosopher? Oh, who knows? <laughs> yeah, I know. yeah, yeah, very good. Well, over coffee in the library, Blaine says that he's now free to speak with even less constraint there are no other ears around 
these ears that he says might be the hallucinations of a mind too long engaged with intelligence, but even so. Blaine recounts Stephen's letters about Clarissa's past life in the brothel. He says that they had been an excellent source of intelligence. This is when Clarissa had had a big confessional conversation with Stephen and he had reported this back to Sir Joseph. As Stephen had requested, Sir Joseph had taken care of Clarissa, got her husband promoted and got him a ship and took Clarissa to work and live with Diana when Oakes was killed. And Mike, this is news, I think, here that Oakes had uh, had died. We're not ever going to find out how or in what circumstances. Through the information that Clarissa had brought, they had identified this guy, the high-placed protector of Ledwood and Ray, a fellow French spy. And Mike, here comes the name, the Duke of Habachtal. And in this nice little musical aside here, he describes Habachtal as a hemidemi royal. This guy is a member of the extended British royal family. He's what he calls a Dutch duke. And I think Dutch is a corruption for, for German here because right. this duchy of Habachtal is close to Hanover, large estate on the Rhine, both now occupied by the French, therefore making this duke a potential target for French blackmail. Very nearly, says Sir Joseph, untouchable. Stephen believes that this person has a high army rank, perhaps an honorary rank, and therefore considerable influence. And Blaine says, yes, this guy is an advisor to several bodies and sits on important committees through his aide-de-camp, Colonel Blagden. And Mike, this raises the question then, what can Stephen and Blaine and their partners in spying do with all of this information? Yeah, they, they've got this. But Blaine says right now, you know, this guy, as he said, is very nearly untouchable. And they can't go after him directly because of his status without cast iron evidence, like the kind they had on Ledward and Ray. But Blaine has instead kind of discreetly conveyed a threat throughout Whitehall. And, you know, he says, talks about the Byzantine ways that threats bounce off the walls there. And that initially stopped the passing of secret information to France. But he believes as the Duke realized his own impunity, he's become active again. And they just recently lost most of a West Indies convoy last month. Well, Blaine believes that the Duke, who's an old hand in the ministry, an old hand at court, has now traced this threat back to Blaine and perhaps to Stephen. Mm-hmm. And he's concerned about the Duke's resentment. He says this Duke is, a, a, you know, we know from history is a bitterly revengeful man. Now, Blaine says he's not certain of all this. You know, his Uneasy feelings may be the signs of a weak, illogical, or superstitious mind. But he says there are two concrete things that kind of point in this direction. He said, you know, seeing you may have noticed today, two members of the Intelligence Committee, Montague and his cousin, are fighting shy of him. Fighting shy of him. Ian, what fighting shy of? What? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the fighting shy means being unwilling to get involved. Fighting shy means kind of choosing not to fight and kind of dancing away from the subject a little bit. And that's a pretty confident assertion for Sir Joseph to make. And he's all the way through this conversation. I think he's showing a little bit of the maybe overconfidence and hubris that we've seen from Stephen before. Ah. But if the committee and Montague and his cousin are fighting shy of Sir Joseph, that's because maybe he's riding his luck for now. We, we do know that Sir Joseph has been able, unable, for unspecified reasons, to make headway on getting pardons for Mrs. Oaks or Padine. So there's something still not quite right in the establishment here. Well, that ought to have been a very simple matter. There have been strange delays. There's been some kind of unavowed or unaccountable reluctance in the official channels. He hasn't made a direct request for these pardons yet. He wouldn't put anything in writing until he was pretty sure of a favorable outcome, because that's the expectation of how these things are normally done. He thinks then that he might abandon the usual channels and instead ask Stephen to speak to the Duke of Sussex, since that Duke and Stephen are both founder members of the Council Against Slavery, touch point for this chapter in this book, and fellows of the Royal Society. But the Duke of Sussex, as described here, is away in Lisbon. Now, the Duke of Sussex, Mike, was... A prince, a member of the royal family, Prince Augustus Frederick, the sixth son and the ninth child of King George III and his queen consort, Charlotte of Mecklenburg-Strelitz. He was the only one of the descendants of George III who didn't pursue a career in the army or the navy, was well known as a liberal, was interested in parliamentary reform, abolition of the slave trade, emancipation of Catholics. Sounds like Stephen's kind of guy. 
But the Duchy of Sussex died out a couple of decades later. And right now, the Duchy of Sussex is in the hand of another member of the royal family who's the guy busy trying to get you all to read his royal autobiography just now, but not a blood descendant <laughs> of the Duke of Sussex that we're talking about here. In a little fun kind of inner chapter Easter egg tie-in, the Duke of Sussex, the original one we're talking about here, it was his mother, Queen Charlotte, who turned over the rights to Somerset House in 1775. So I don't ah. know, just for fun. <laughs> Good connection. Well, Sir Joseph says, look, I'm, I'm making an academic point about Mrs. Oaks or Padine. You know, he's simply trying to make the point that he's, you know, not getting his way the way he used to. He says that Mrs. Oaks or Padine, unless they make themselves known, there's a little likelihood that anybody is going to know who they are or, or anything right. about them. But Blaine says, you know, if the Duke has made his dislike of Blaine known, that this would kind of explain what some of the things that are happening to Blaine, you know, that he would have become at least, he says, slightly leprous. Uh, and so nobody in their right mind would be doing him any favors right now. Blaine, right. Right. the text says, I do not intend to imply any direct malignity extending beyond me and perhaps you, if indeed that malignity exists at all and is not the figment of a fagged out mind and an overwrought imagination. So I think he's trying to say, you and I might be in a little bit of jeopardy, but then again, it just might be this, you know, this fagged out mind and overwrought imagination of mine. And, and Stephen has an answer for that, right? Yeah, he does. Fagged out minds, he says, overwrought imaginations, I have just the thing. He introduces Sir Joseph to coca leaves, tells him how to use them, gives him a pouch of his own supply. St Stephen the pusher, right? From the addict to the pusher is only a small step. <laughs> Oh, no. And uh, his description of the coca leaves is really fascinating. He says, They produce an increasingly remarkable and evident clarity of mind, a serenity, and a perception that almost all worries are of little real consequence, most of them being the result of confused, anxious, and generally fallacious notions that crowd and increase in direct proportion to the decline of pure, single-minded reason. So there you go. Cocaine is the harmless adjunct to noble enlightenment philosophical thinking, no, I don't think so, Steve. <laughs> Anyhow, so he, he, he is aware of some of the safety consequences of taking coca leaves. He says, don't take them now if you value your sleep. And Sir Joseph says, if it diminishes anxiety by even a half a percent, he'll take some immediately. Now, we go on and learn a little bit about what's worrying Sir Joseph in the back of his mind here. The Dutch Duke, this guy Habax Tali says, is a small part of my worries. It's overshadowed by the situation in the Adriatic, in Malta, and the crisis in the Levant. And Mike, this is another one of those places where you can disappear a mile down a rabbit hole. And it's very easy to suppose that O'Brien has just dropped in the Adriatic and the Levant and Malta as just other minor theatres. But if you look into it, in the Adriatic, there was the Adriatic campaign of 1807 to 1814, Look at the names of the ships occupied in the Adriatic campaign, and you've got some old Patrick O'Brien friends and standbys there. We've got HMS Amphion, HMS Bellpool, and our old friend HMS Alceste, although she's placed anachronistically, she's out of her timeline. In the Adriatic campaign, HMS Alceste was uh, taking part in actions before she had later gone over to the Far East, to China, to the story that was the inspiration for 13-Gun Salute and Nutmeg of Consolation. Anyhow, Mike, these, these connections, these Easter eggs are everywhere you look. And if we're feeling a little bit dizzied by all of this, if like Sir Joseph, we are a bit aware of our minds being fagged out and our imaginations being overwrought, now might be the time to get some refreshment of absolutely any kind. But Mike, in my case, I think it's going to be a cup of tea. How about you? Oh, right, right. Maybe coffee here. Great idea. We'll be right back then, just after this short break. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Welcome back. We hope that your minds are a bit less fagged out after the break. Like we often do, right after the break, we're going to do some parish notices. We want to say thank you to a couple of listeners for keeping us on track with our pronunciation. Uh, Kate Bunting from The Gun Room. Hello, Kate. Chris Kendall on Twitter. Hello, Chris. Both pointed out after the episode before last 
that the ship commanded by Captain Henry Dundas, we pronounce her name as Berenice, we think she should actually have four syllables because it's a classic Greek name and might be Berenice or Berenice. Uh, and that would make Jack Aubrey's pun about how nice it was to see her make even more sense. So Kate and Chris, thank you very much. I'm sure you're in the right of it. Um, we will make one minor point for the defence, which is that Patrick Tull, who probably didn't benefit from a classical education in his narration, gives Berenice, uh, gives her only the three syllables. But thank you anyway, and we'll watch out for that in the future. Meanwhile, the Berenice's former tender, the Ringle, sails into Shelmiston Harbour, dropping anchor next to the Surprise, whose crew teased them about taking so long to get home. Tom and Stephen and Sarah and Emily and Padine all head for Ashgrove from there in two chases. The household at Ashgrove already knows that they're on their way and, Mike, we're getting into Mrs. Williams' territory again. Oh, how I have not missed Mrs. Williams. Mrs. Williams tells Sophie that all these menfolk, all their long-lost sailors, are going to be there shortly, and she announces that Mrs. Williams and Mrs. Morris believe that it's her duty to tell Captain Aubrey about Diana's disgraceful conduct so that he can break the news gently to his friend. Sophie says that the family doctor, Dr. Gower, has asked Jack to be kept quiet and undisturbed and begs her mother not to talk to the captain. Meanwhile, the doctor himself, Dr. Gower, checks in on Jack, tells Sophie that, yes, he must indeed be kept perfectly quiet in a darkened room, suggests that Jack might, might perhaps value reading Blair's sermons or Young's night thoughts and says he believes that Jack's had far too much mental agitation recently. He leaves some drops to be administered to Jack, prescribes a low diet and heads off to check on the children who have their own set of medical problems having come down with some nasty symptoms upon their rapid return from Dorset. And Mike, what, what kind of literary recommendation is this that we're getting for Jack Aubrey here? Well, I, I think these are two questionable book choices, Ian. You know, Dr. Gower's recommendations. You know, if he wants Jack to calm himself, I'm not sure that a five-volume set of sermons by Hugh Blair, a very prominent Scottish preacher, is is quite called for. Sermon one is called On the Causes of Men's Being Wary of Life. So the other book is Night Thoughts, a long poem by Edward Young, published between 1742 and 1745 in nine parts. That's nine nights of musing on death over this series of nights. And the writer is pondering the loss of his wife, the loss of his friends, and lamenting human frailties. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first of the nine nights, Night Thoughts, is on life, death, and immortality. So I'm, I'm not sure if you don't want Jack to be disturbed, you don't want to give him any mental agitation, this is not necessarily what I think you want him to be reading. However, I will say there are some incredible uh, engravings, these illustrations by William Blake in Night Thoughts. So, you know, I can't help but wonder if this is a, an O'Brien literary joke, but I'm, I'm happy to get schooled by anybody seeing another connection for these uh, for these books. Oh, fantastic. I, lo I love the idea of Night Thoughts being a recipe for self-reflection for Jack Aubrey. Um, mm, not, not sure Jack Aubrey and William Blake would have seen eye to eye, but anyway, I like the connection. Right. Well, <laughs> when Sophie and Dr. Gower leave, Mrs. Williams decides that she's going to take care of this. She walks into Jack's room, asks him how he is, pretty well, he says, looking forward to seeing Stephen. And she says, Captain, in order that you should be able to break the dreadful news gradually and gently to your poor unfortunate friend, I think it my duty to tell you that since the birth of this idiot child, Diana has been drinking heavily. And having already stuck her nose in in that way, she goes on to say that Diana has been dining with what she thinks of as fast, raffish people as far as 20 miles away. Good Lord. Um, going to balls and masquerades in Portsmouth, fox hunting, often without a groom, heaven forbid. She says Diana's no sort of mother. If it weren't for Mrs. Oakes, the poor little girl, she's meaning Bridget, would be left just with the servants. And worse still, she said, lowering her voice, worse still, Mr. Aubrey, I say this of my own niece with the greatest reluctance, as you may imagine, worse still, there are doubts about her conduct. She clarifies that when she says doubts her conduct, she believes that their neighbour, Colonel Hoskins, has given evidence of uh, some kind of story that Mrs. Ho Mrs. Hoskins has 
no longer returns Diana's calls. And that must be clear evidence, she thinks, that there's something not right with Diana's behaviour. Now, Mrs. Morris, Mrs. Williams' friend, arrives out of breath saying that she has sad news for Captain Albury. She thinks it only right to tell him since it's too easy to nourish a viper into one bosom, which is, is an old saying meaning to unknowingly have an ungrateful or treacherous friend coming from the uh, Aesop's fable about a farmer sheltering a snake dying from the cold that bites and kills the farmer. Acting on information, this is Mrs. Morris, from her man, Mr. Briggs, she had caught no less a person than preserved Killick, making off with a hamper of wine through the back lane to the servants' quarters. And in her report, Killick had been rude to her, had not called her mom, and said that the captain had given it to him. She was coming here to tell the captain before Killick could hide the wine or take it back to the cellar. And I love Jack's response here. Jack says to her, well, that's very kind of you, but I had given the clamper of wine to Killick. And Mrs. Morris is taken very aback, saying her intention was, of course, good. Yeah, yeah, of course it was, just like Mrs. Williams. And started to say, well, my father had no notion of giving, and means to go on and say, no notion of giving wine to servants. But she stops and leaves, making what O'Brien calls discontented motions with her shoulders, arms, and buttocks. <laughs> And I, I like this, Mike, because either of two explanations works for me here. Either Killick had indeed been given the wine by Chuck Aubrey, and why not? In which case, good for both of them. Or Jack promptly and with great presence of mind made up the story to cover for Killick and wipe Mrs. Morris's eye. And I don't mind which it is. Yay for Killick. Yay for Jack. Yabu sucks to Mrs. Morris. Yeah, I, I, I'm a, your way of thinking entirely. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Williams says, but as I was saying before, dear Selena came on her mistaken but very well meant errand, the <laughs> greatest cause. For, yeah, right. Well meant, right. The greatest cause for general comment and disapproval was Diana's almost, what shall I call it, liaison with Mr. Wilson, who managed <laughs> her stud. A most improper occupation for a woman, even a married woman. Ooh. She goes on to say that they lived in the same house, or if not in the same house, in, in a very close house, in, in a very isolated part of the country, and that she tried to talk with Diana, but Diana resented the admonition and had always been an undutiful girl. And Jack interrupts her. He says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I thought you said Diana had provided all the capital for your current business. And, and we remember that when we last left Mrs. Williams, she'd lost everything. She was penniless, dependent on yeah. Jack and Sophie's good graces. And now she seems to be well off again. Well, Mrs. Williams blows that off, saying that the money meant nothing to Diana, given her enormous winnings. And Dr. M, you know, who left far too much at Diana's uncontrolled and unsupervised discretion. Anyway, I'm going to pause for a moment here and go, Diana's unsupervised discretion. You know, she should have had a man of business like Mrs. Williams had had, the oh, one who, yeah. who ruined her fortune. Right? <laughs> so, you know, that we're back to Stephen saying, you know, the wife probably shouldn't turn that back over to the man because she probably knows a lot more. So, yeah. anyway, well, and she says, Mrs. Williams says, she and Selena Morris will probably pay Diana back presently. I think this is two years later. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to get around to paying her money back. But, she continues the tale. The last time they had seen Diana, Mrs. Morris was certain she was with child. And they'd heard that all her horses had been sent up to London. The grooms had been turned away. And Diana has gone off the Texas, no doubt, with her handsome manager. And she concludes, you must break it gently to your poor friend or he will run mad. And I'm just, oh, man, I'm tearing my hair out here. What little I have left yeah. here. <laughs> and I, I think, you know, Mrs. Williams and Mrs. Morris, you know, practice schadenfreude at a master's, maybe a doctoral level, you know, just absolute experts at this. Well, she's feeling very pleased with herself, Mrs. Williams, because, you know, Jack has been quiet this entire time. So she's quite certain he's in full agreement. But I'm, I'm hoping he's not. No, and I'm super happy to read this next piece. Jack says, I shall certainly do nothing of the kind. Upon my word, she cried in her indignation, then I shall do it myself. If you presume to speak to him on this subject, said Jack in a low tone, but nevertheless carried full conviction, you and Mrs. Morris and your servant Briggs will leave this house within the hour. And O'Brien gives us a bit of commentary here that Mrs. Williams had changed a lot while Jack was gone, but not so much 
as to be willing to forego free board and housing wherever she wanted. She closed her lips tight, says the text, and pale with anger, left the room with much the same gestures as her friend. And at this point, I am giving Jack a big old round of applause. That settled her hash. At least for now. At least for now. And I'm also happy that this means that Jack's faculties are restored and whatever injury he got from the falling off the horse, the essential Jack is still intact and in good shape here. Now, this sounds like this has really raised Jack's anger, but the text goes on and says he's too happy to be angry for long. He already knew quite a lot of what Mrs. Williams had been trying to disclose here through some of Sophie's letters. He'd certainly already known about Diana's views on sexual morality, that they're a lot like his. He doesn't really believe, though, even a tenth part of all the gossip, particularly the piece about her running off with the manager. He regrets that Stephen's going to be incredibly heavily disappointed, but he believes this marriage will hold together. It's certainly borne extraordinary strains of this kind in the past. And I, I like that we get to be in Jack's head here. We spent a lot of time in the last book and in the last couple of chapters in Stephen's headspace. But here we are with Jack. There's all this happiness, but also all this grief in his mind. And he escapes the confusion and then the guilt of feeling joyful at this time by thinking about the change in Mrs. Williams. Two years ago, Diana had won a large bet at 35 to 1 on the St. Ledger. I might. 35s is pretty good odds for a winning horse. Um, she had pooled money that she'd taken from many people, the cook's half guinea, 25 guineas from a cavalry officer's widow, lots of five guinea bets from tolerably well-to-do widow ladies in Bath who'd like to gamble, but who were coming up with stakes that were too small for reliable London betting officers. They, meanwhile, not being willing to trust the local riffraff around them who might take small stakes bets. So she had pooled all these bets, put on a bet with a reputable gaming house, and after Diana had paid everyone off with several thousand to spare, she had suggested that her meek and penniless aunt, Mrs. Williams, could take over the whole operation, keeping a book, but do it for a profit as her own betting office. And in a remarkable piece of magnanimity, Diana had taught Mrs. Williams how to keep a book. Now, Jack, knowing all of this, doesn't still know how Mrs. Morris fits in. Maybe she provided a bit of respectability for this whole operation. Her servant, who expected other servants to give him a mister, to call him Mrs. Briggs, had himself worked for a racehorse owner. And these two ladies, Mrs. Morris and Mrs. Williams, had this respectability and reliability and discretion and a degree of convenience that made their business prosper. Now, Jack couldn't figure out how Mrs. Williams reconciled her new undertaking as a, an unlicensed bookmaker with her formal principles of being a you know, high-placed and very upstanding member of society. But anyway, she had always been the kind of woman to go looking for high returns for her investment, and that had been her undoing in the past. But now she's growing richer again and, true to character, more and more unpleasant. As Jack's thinking about all this, Stephen comes in and he, and he says he's sorry to see poor Jack brought so low. He asks about his pain. He asks if he can bear talking. And Jack says very loudly, oh, he can. And how glad he is to see Stephen. His head hurts, but he reports his heart is bounding like a lamb because of a signal he received from the Port Admiral on Wednesday. And Jack stops, asks Stephen about his journey, about how business went in London. Stephen says everything went well. And he's planning to take the girls up to meet Diana and return them then back to the grapes. Jack tells him that all this noise upstairs, you know, they, they're hearing all the stuff in the background, is Sophie with the kids all sick. And he asks Stephen if he would like to hear about his signal. So I think Jack has shown incredible restraint here. You know, he's been dying to tell him, but he is, you know, let me check on you. So he contains himself long enough to find out how Stephen is doing. And Jack tells Stephen that he is to have the Balonuts, a 74 gun, with a broad pennant and Tom under him, along with the terrible, another 74, three frigates, one sure to be the Pyramus. That is an actual 36-gun frigate launched in 1810. And Jack adds perhaps a half dozen sloops. He says it's what Hennage had told him about, but Jack had thought it to be too good to be true. And Stephen gives the appropriate response. I give you all the joy in the world of your command, my dear. Long, long may it prosper. Amen. And, and Jack very hopefully 
asked Stephen if, if he'll come along, reminding him, you know, it is to put down the slave trade and everything should be ready to go by the 25th of next month. Stephen says he will. But now, my dear Commodore, I must go and look at your children. You know, he tells him that he'd promised Sophie and Dr. Gower that he'd consult with them and he promised not to tire Jack. And then he says he's off to Bar- Barham and he doesn't want to get there after dark and have Diana worrying, you know, where in the world is he? You know, has he fallen into a ditch somewhere? Well, when Jack hears about Stephen leaving to find Diana, his spirits fall at once. The text says he hesitated and said, it's quite a while since Sophie has seen her. Some disagreement with Diana's aunt, I believe. But Stephen, do not be disappointed if she's away. Nobody knew we were coming back, you know. Stephen smiles and says, not to worry. He and Diana will be there back to see them in a few days. And I'm like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> And we've been dwelling on the possibility of this really painful return that Stephen's going to make to his home. And and O'Brien is letting us into it really, really gently because we get the good news about Jack being a Commodore and interwoven in amongst all of this kind of downheartedness. And interwoven with it as well, we have the sight of Tom Pullings, who has been promoted. Stephen sees Tom in the hall. He says, alone, leaping and making antic gestures. And turning around, he shows a face of such laughing delight that the devil himself could not have failed to smile. And Tom is overjoyed. It's very touching as well. The first thing he asks is, can I go see the captain? And Stephen says, yes, as long as you don't speak loud or agitate his mind. And Tom, overwhelmed with joy, grabs hold of Stephen's elbow in an iron grip and says, the captain will hoist a broad pennant in Bellona and he has named Tom as captain under him. And the consequences of that for Tom are immense. I am a post-captain. I never thought it could happen. Stephen shook his hand and said, I am so happy. At this rate, Tom, I shall live to congratulate you on your flag. Tom thanks him and says, I have never heard his sentiment so well expressed, nor with such elegance and wit neither. And bless him, it's it's not anything above just a congratulatory statement of fact, but in his present mood for Tom Pullings, everything is elegant and witty. It's, it's really great, isn't it? We have these kind of strong... Ah, oh, these strong emotional responses to people who are getting such great news. It's like Tom's a family member. Yeah, and it's what, what's it been? Eight books ago since Tom wet his Commander Schwab in Treason's Harbor. So, you know, oh, it's about time we had some good news for Tom. That was definitely. that was awesome. I'm, I'm like you, Ian. I got uh, it, some really heartfelt emotions reading this. Yeah. I was so happy, so proud. Oh, uh, well, Stephen goes on, kisses Sophie on both cheeks says she's in a most charming bloom, but also sees some nervous tension in her. So he's going to ask Dr. Gowers to provide a mild dose of hellebore for Mrs. Aubrey and for the Commodore. And, and you know, continue with this glowing family pride and joy. Sophie murmurs the Commodore and squeezes Stephen's arm. So, you know, and I'm, I'm just kind of taken away too and thinking, you know, my gosh, you know, he's been gone for years. He's just back. Now he's been promoted. He'll be heading right off again. But she's so thrilled about this. So I thought, ah, this is awesome. Well, so they look at Sophie's girls, and Stephen agrees with Dr. Gower's diagnosis in advanced state of the commencement of measles. Uh, Stephen says, look at the swollen, bloated appearance of poor Charlotte's face. Fanny replies, I'm not Charlotte, I'm Fanny, and my face is neither swollen nor bloated. And Sophie <laughs> is just you know, kind of shocked at, at this abrupt reply to the doctor. And uh, so she's taken aback. Stephen's fine. Stephen says he's sorry that it's the measles since now he can't bring Sarah and Emily up because they have been off in South Seas Islands. They have no natural resistance to the measles, you know, and he so wanted them to meet the family. But as he leaves, he says in Sophie's ear, I'm so very happy about Jack. And again, I'm just, oh, I love this. Wow. All that joy is kind of paused for a second for me on the stairs he says to himself presently i shall see a little face that is neither swollen nor bloated one that is incapable of such a gross reply and i i think you know stephen is really thinking what little he's heard of bridget you know simply that kind of first note from diana what he's going to find there and i boy this is just so deep he gets to the drawing room only Mrs. Williams is there. You know, he'd left the girls there. And Stephen asks her about Sarah and Emily. 
And she's, you know, Mrs. Williams very mad because they did not curtsy to her. They didn't call her ma'am. And she'd sent them to the kitchen where she said they belonged. And Stephen reminds her that they grew up on a man of war where there are no gentlewomen and any curtsies are reserved for officers. And then Mrs. Williams, you know, doubles down. She just sniffs and just seems absolutely delighted to tell Stephen, well, now that they're in England, they can no longer be slaves. They are now free. And Stephen's going to lose the price that he paid for them, adding that since he's a foreigner, he cannot understand the English love of liberty. And I'm, I'm just seized by the <laughs> irony of having this English gentlewoman explain the English love of liberty to an Irishman like Stephen who went through the rising. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, how bad can this get here? And then she realizes, you know, how they were dressed and every, how they were actually acting, that the girls might be protégés rather than bond servants. And she starts to make an ill-natured comment, but sees Stephen's pale eyes as he puts on his hat and she holds her tongue. <laughs> I can only imagine how Stephen's feeling here. You know, and so he's, you know, your servant, ma'am, leaves. And I love this. He finds the girls in the kitchen telling two former ship's cooks, you know, Jack has always had old shipmates and retired shipmates there. The girls are telling them about the green ice they saw off the horn. So, ah, back to the sailing family again. Ah, it's wonderful. And we've got more and more uncertainty in our minds here. If Mrs. Williams and Mrs. Morris can revert or, or e- evolve back into kind of unpleasant, undesirable characters... If all of that can happen, then I think Stephen's wondering, despairing and hoping at once what might be going on with his wife and his child. On the ride home, Stephen's mind is then troubled with all this different variety of emotions. O'Brien calls it intense anticipation and a dread he did not choose to name. Mm. So like Jack does, he takes refuge in thinking about Mrs. Williams and he reflects on how she had come not only from being a broken spirited poor relation, perpetually aware of her dependence back to her former degree of assurance, though, not in need of dominance, but that noticing that Sophie had grown much stronger and capable, he's talking again about Mrs. Williams here, of indignant self-righteousness, but that she was also a bit disreputable, throwing herself into chairs and making an occasionally absurdly inappropriate, gross, ungenteel or incongruous expression. And this long list reminds us, I think, a little bit of Stephen's old blistering string of adjectives from Mrs. Williams. It would not surprise me, he says to himself, if she has taken to putting gin in her tea and to the use of snuff. Um, And Mike, this also reminds me of the evolution that Stephen saw in Diana way back in the fortune of war, that he noticed this kind of coarsening of her and he saw this as a very unpleasant sign of shifting in her character. And maybe I'm linking the two together and thinking Stephen is speculating to himself, How has my wife changed? What is her character now? What am I going to encounter when I get to Barham? This this is where he's at. He's on his way to Barham. The postillion, the coachman, stops for directions, gets lost, backtracks. Not long after sunset then, pulls up finally to Barham Down. There are no lights inside. Stephen knocks and rings the bell. His heart beating high, it says. Not unlike Jack Aubrey's heart beating high at the good news earlier on, but now I think Stephen's heart is beating high in anticipation of potential bad news he hears a dog far away in the back he knocks and pulls the bell wire until he hears it ring for himself a light cracks through the door and clarissa asks who is there good news we found clarissa stephen matcherin my dear i'm sorry we're so late and clarissa opens the door to him she takes off the chain opens the door uncocks the horse pistol that she's been holding in her hand loaded and ready for use And she holds out her hand and Stephen says, nonsense, we embrace and gives her a big resounding kiss. She tells him, you haven't changed. (laughs) And the last time they saw each other, they weren't far away from embracing and talking about loaded pistols then either. So it's like Mm. they've hardly been apart. He asks if she's alone. She says she is, except for Bridget. So we're going to encounter Bridget. Here we go. He brings in, meanwhile, Sarah and Emily, his old shipmates. They they curtsy, as the text says, they make their bob. And they ask her, how do you do, ma'am, in unison? And they know who to say ma'am to, even if Mrs. Williams and Mrs. Morris wish that they could get a bit more respect. Clarissa greets them. She kisses the girls and shakes Padine's hand. 
even though Clarissa and the girls hadn't got along all that well on the nutmeg, the girls are in fact glad to see a familiar face here in this very strange country, in this very strange and forbidding house. They're a bit shaken by the tall, gaunt, cold aspect of this house. It's one of the few old houses unaltered in the last two centuries. House, therefore, with a great hall rising up to the roof, illuminated by Clarissa's single lantern. And Mike, th- this is a very gothic and kind of chilly picture we've got of Barham, and it feels like it's empty. Yeah, yeah, it really does. And almost kind of gives me that same echo of Jack getting back home, you know, except this seems mm-hmm. even more deserted. And they go all the way across this hall, way down. There's a small carpeted room with candles, a fireplace, and a small girl building card houses on a table near the grate. And Clarissa says not to mind if she doesn't speak. And Stephen can feel what he calls the controlled anguish in her voice. Looking at Bridget, you know, lit by the candles, lit by this fire, Stephen sees, the text says, a slim, fair-haired child, quite extraordinarily beautiful, but with a disquieting, elfin, changeling beauty. And I just, boy, I was just so taken by that description. Right, tells us that she had perfectly coordinated movements. She's handling the cards, glancing at Stephen and the others without the least interest in them and without ceasing to place her cards as she kind of looks around and looks back, starting now the fifth story on this card house. Well, Clarissa tells her to come and pay her duty to her father and leads her over. She's unresisting. She comes to Stephen, makes her bob, kind of like straight as an arrow, but bobs down, and only shrinks away slightly when he kisses her. Sarah and Emily and Bridget make their bobs to one another as they're introduced, and Bridget walks back to her card house. The text says, unconscious of their faces. So unconscious of anybody's faces here. But it says she does look into Padine's face for a moment. So interesting. Stephen sits in an elbow chair, has kind of moved himself out of the light so he can watch his daughter as Clarissa asks Emily and Sarah about their journey, about Ashgrove, about their clothes. And and as their shyness wears off, they're talking away. But even Sarah and Emily's eyes, the text says, were fixed of the sight of the wholly self-possessed, self-absorbed figure by the hearth. So, we're getting wow. yeah, we're getting these incredibly fabulous descriptions of Bridget for you know, and we're now seeing her years later for the first time here, and I'm I'm just completely taken oh, in here, and that's I'm, great. I'm I'm so absorbed, but I'm 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 appreciative of a little bit of a break here. Yeah, and O'Brien is taking us into this scene and into this situation, like you say, step by step. There's this worry, I think, on Stephen's mind and on our mind as well that this this child is very very detached very detached from the world, very uncommunicative. And this is softened a little bit by the sight of what he sees next. Servants bring some food and an ancient white-muzzled kitchen dog follows them in. And here comes the first relief to what the text says is Stephen's quite extraordinary pain. Extraordinary in that he had never known any of the same nature or of the same intensity. This came when the old dog sniffed at the back of Bridget's leg And without stopping her left hand's delicate motion, she reached down with the other to scratch his forehead, whilst something of pleasure showed through her gravity. So she's got a connection. She's got a relationship with somebody in the world. The person in the world that she has a relationship with so far is the kitchen dog. Now, nothing disturbs her indifference. Nothing really breaks into her reverie and her focus on building the card house even when a a draft of air comes through the room and knocks over the card house. She very placidly eats her bread and milk with Sarah and Emily, unmoved by their presence, it says. And after a good night ceremony in which Stephen blessed her, she went off to bed with neither reluctance nor complaint. He observed with still another kind of pang, that if ever their eyes met, hers moved directly on, as they might have moved on from those of a marble bust or of a creature devoid of interest since it belonged to a different order. Wow. And Mike, the, the, the descriptions of our encounters here with Bridget are just stunning. And as you and I have been r- reading so much more carefully as we've gone through this, so many times when I've noticed afresh, 
new connections between what we're reading here and other parts of the canon. And it has never occurred to me until today to think of the contrast that I'm now noticing between the description of our first encounter with Bridget and the description of Stephen's first encounter with Dill way back in HMS Surprise. And, and maybe we can come back and talk about that later. But it is just w- wonderful, really, really absorbing writing here. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm absolutely with you. It, and and what, a, what a fabulous connection. Gosh. Well, later, everybody's sort of gone off to bed. Sitting at the dining table, Stephen asks Clarissa if Bridget can speak at all. And Clarissa says occasionally she hears something like it, but it always stops when Clarissa comes into the room. She says, Bridget seems to understand almost everything and is, in her words, good and biddable unless she's having one of her bad days. Mm. Stephen asks if she's affectionate. And Clarissa, the text says, I like to think so. Indeed, it is probable, but the signs are hard to make out. Well, Stephen eats wolfishly. You know, they put some kind of cold cuts out here. He asks Clarissa to tell him anything that she can properly tell him about Diana and says, as a friend, you know, I, I know you can't say anything, for example, about her lovers. And then he asks if, if they were friends. And she says they were, that Diana was very kind when Oakes was at sea mm-hmm. and even kinder after he was killed. But that by that time, it was clear Bridget was not like ordinary people, which distressed Diana. She drank too much. She spoke wildly. She was indiscreet. But even still, she was still kind to Clarissa, even teaching her to ride, which has been a real joy for her. And the text says, very kind. And I'm not an ungrateful creature, you know, said Clarissa, laying her hand on Stephen's arm. But there were reserves. I believe she was deeply convinced that I was or had been your mistress, And when I protested my complete indifference where such matters were concerned, she only smiled politely, repeating that catchphrase. And Ian, your French is so much better than mine. So if you would honor (laughs) us with this catchphrase. Les hommes, c'est difficile de s'endormir sans. Uh, Man, it's difficult to fall asleep without them. Or put it another way, guys, can't live with them? Can't live with them. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right, right. Yeah. And... Clarissa continues to say, Diane would say that, and she says, I could not prove my point with the confidences that you so kindly listened to on that remote island when we were aboard the nutmeg, dear ship. Confidences, I may say, that I have never made to anyone but you and never shall. So, wow. Mm-hmm. You know, it's an incredible relationship the two of them have that Clarissa is saying, you know, nobody else is going to find out about that part of me, so they might not quite believe all that I told you and the reasons you believe me. I think she's saying here, too, that she told Diana, as she tells the world in general, as Sir Joseph had advised her, that she's a governess, she disliked her employment at New South Wales, and ran away with a sailor. I think perhaps that's one of the reasons Diana is sort of saying, well, if that's all there is, and Stephen's sending you to live here, yeah, I'm a little suspicious about this. Yeah, not the first time one of Stephen's uh, untruths that he tells for the sake of concealing his activities end up biting him in the personal realm, if that's, if that's the right way to put it. Absolutely true. Yeah. Stephen asks, when did Diana's unhappiness begin then? He's asking for more details here. Clarissa says that it was very early before she met her. Diana had missed Stephen cruelly, had, in giving birth to Bridget, had an interminable labor and had encountered a fool of a man midwife. After the baby was put out to nurse and then returned to Diana, Bridget had looked enchanting and Diana was sure she would love her, but the child was totally indifferent. So clearly from birth, there's been this disconnect and and what we're all reading this. And, and thinking about what we know these days about the patterns of autistic spectrum disorder of AST and is this child autistic? It's never given the name, but that's clearly the situation that Diana was encountering here with Bridget. The child, says Clarissa, wished neither to love nor to be loved. And Diana would, was bewildered by this response or by her perception of this response, taking it very much to heart. Clarissa's coming then at this stage had been some kind of relief, but Diana had grown more unhappy and often difficult. This was a time when Mrs. Williams, who was as early as then already becoming difficult and very unkind, Bridget's indifference had grown to a positive aversion and even a cold dislike. And I think we're talking here about a dislike 
that Diana feels is aimed at her, not a dislike aimed at Mrs. Williams. Right. And right. And Steve was clearly wondering whether any of the communications that he'd sent back had had any kind of bearing on the situation. And only the letter that Oakes and Clarissa had brought from Stephen had reached Diana. None of his other letters, none of his other efforts at communicating with her via, via you know, packets and f- friends and fellow travelers around the world. They would have been a great help. But in, in their absence, Diana had given up hope. So many ships are lost. So many sailor husbands never come home. She had dreaded Stephen's eventual return. And she had therefore taken against the house. She'd said that Stephen would not have wanted her to buy it. It's cold. It's lonely. It's inconvenient. She had loved, though, her horses almost to the end. But then she'd suddenly given up the stud, even though it was quite successful. She'd sent the rest of the horses and the manager off a week later, all except for one stallion and two mares that had gone to the North Country to a house near Doncaster. She had dismissed all the grooms except the one looking after Clarissa's Arab. And Mike, I'm guessing that this might be the groom uh, about whom Mrs. Williams and Mrs. Morris had conjured up this lurid story. She'd also kept the pony with the trap and she had written to her friends to help all these household members find other positions. Diana had begged Clarissa to stay and care for Bridget until she could make other arrangements and had, for that purpose, left her a quantity of money. She had said that she would write, but had only written once. And Stephen comments on this saying, well, she was never really a letter writer. And Clarissa, I mean, I, I, my, my heart sinks here because Stephen being about to receive a second-hand letter from Diana is never a good moment in a Patrick O'Brien tale. She did write one, says Clarissa, just for him in case he should come home. Stephen, in anticipation of reading this letter, rolls himself a big ball of coca leaves, his perennial crutch here, um, while she goes for the letter. Thank heavens, on behalf of readers and friends of Stephen, he throws the ball of coca leaves in the fire before she opens the door. She fetches port as he reads the letter. Stephen says the letter. I know you loathe women who have no fortitude, but I have not the courage to bear it any longer. If you come back, if you ever come back, do not, do not despise me. And this is another one of those valedictory letters from Diana that he just has to sit and process. He sits silently. Clarissa pours the port. And they both listen to the rain pouring from the eaves. And, and Mike, as we've said many times before, when the rain is falling, it's falling for a reason. Right, right. Yeah. I, one thing to, to get back in, in, in terms of that manager and Diana, the groom that stayed is an old groom, Smith, not the red whiskered guy that Mrs. Oh, Williams was talking right. about. Oh, right. So Thank you. My mistake. It kind of yeah. did my heart good a little bit to say, well, wait a minute. She sent off all the horses to London with the guy that... You know, they're accusing her of, of having the liaison with. So I thought, okay, at least that didn't. Yeah. No. Ah, thank you. Well, you know, we've had, you know, as you say, Clarissa and Stephen silent in the pouring rain, the rain that's there for a reason. And then the text says, coming back to the commonplace world. And this is about Stephen. You know, Stephen tells Clarissa he's infinitely obliged to her for looking after his daughter and, you know, staying on at the house says that he has to go to town with Sarah and Emily, but will leave Padine with her, that, you know, she shouldn't be left there with this old groom alone. I mean, that, you know, and, and only the old groom to, to kind of protect them and look after them here. He's promised to be back at Ashgrove a week before the squadron sails, and he hopes that they can make better arrangements by then. And, and then he starts rambling about all these kind of, you know, Navy communities where perhaps he could move them and, and realizes that he's rambling here. Uh, but he does say that, you know, he wants to make sure that she and Bridget can live in a place not so isolated as Barham Down, you know, and he says this place would weigh upon an angel's spirits in time. And she interestingly says that while it's cold, dark and sad, it does have glorious rides around it. And she really likes riding. And he notes that a cheerful horse is a delightful, understanding companion. My wife would say, amen. Uh, yeah. And much more balm for the soul than even the biggest ball of coca leaves. So there you go. Um, <laughs> yes. After they finish their port, there's this little unspoken awkwardness about whether he sees Clarissa as any kind of a sexual solace. So they finish their port, and he asks rather awkwardly, where should he sleep? 
He heard himself utter the question, says the text. Almost immediately, he saw that it was that it might be equivocal, and his mind turned quickly in foolish circles. Clarissa remained silent, looking grave. I have been thinking, she said. Nellie and I turned out Diana's room on Friday. A mouse had made her nest between one of the bedposts and the curtain, a soft round ball with five pink creatures inside. She ran off, of course, but we left the nest in a box, and when she came back, I closed the lid and carried them away to the hayloft. For the moment, I could not remember whether we made up the bed again, but now I am quite certain of it. New sheets and clean curtains. End of chapter two. And Mike, if we're not sure whether there's meant to be any solace or comfort for Stephen Matcher in here, I think it is in the fact that the, the redeeming feature of that last paragraph is these wild animals and families is a nest of mice. Yeah, it, a nest of the mice and the mother comes back again. So I, I don't yeah. know if this is an animal story foreshadowing. I don't know if this is one of those metaphor things that come true, but I'm sure hoping and praying it is. Oh my gosh. Well, I'll tell you what a powerful chapter. Um, yeah. I, I think we're a really long way from recycling Patrick O'Brien's greatest hits. Some, you know, something that we felt like we were kind of stuck in just, just a chapter or two ago here. Definitely. And everybody's recovering in, in some way. Jack's recovering from his blow to the head. Sophie and the kids are getting help from the doctor. I'm not sure that Mrs. Williams is recovering, but at least she's having her, her place in the household put to rights by Jack and by Stephen. Everybody except Stephen then, because Stephen's greatest fears seem to have come true. We know that there is indeed an intelligence nemesis at the heart of government who could yet be actively seeking the downfall of Sir Joseph and Stephen. He's had this terrible revelation of the situation with Diana and with Bridget here. It's hard to imagine Jack and Stephen taking on this squadron heading off to West Africa straight away as early as a month from now. But then again, you know, it's hard to imagine him heading back to town in the morning. And like, we, we don't really know, apart from the suggestions of somewhere up north, we don't know very much still about what's happened to Diana. Now, you know, it's funny, Ian. I'll, I'll say this. Any woman who gives up her horses must be in a desperate situation. I mean, that you know, right. <laughs> when she doesn't <laughs> okay. necessarily want to, right? Right. You know, my bride tells me when all else fails, you have to hold, hold to your horses, hold your horses here. And, you know, so I, I'm... I'm thinking, you know, she's got to be in a really dark, bad place. And, and clearly, and I, and I get it, I'm sure if she wasn't meant to be kind of mothering material with the child that she imagined she might have, I'm sure she, you know, ended up with a child that was unimaginable for her. And we know that Diana already has her own issues and how she would relate to this. I'm, I'm taken, as we mentioned, so taken with this description of this beautiful elfin-like Bridget, and as you say, Ian, the you know the parallels, comparing and contrast with Dill, just amazing. The way that we've yeah. got O'Brien now writing characters again, I'm just oh, I'm so glad, so glad, so glad. Ah, uh, so we do have a, a little bit of this reference about going off to the North Country. We've got yeah. uh, Sir Joseph mentioning. You know, perhaps the French coming back to Ireland. I, you know, I don't yeah. know. You know, I, but I'm sort of thinking. Hold on, we keep getting pointed uh, uh, over here too. Here, yeah. Uh, so don't know. Don't know. We've got, we've got lots of potential journeys to follow up on. We've got pursuing Diana into the North Country. We've got the commission for Jack's squadron in West Africa. We've got new animal connections. We've got Clarissa as well, and Sir Joseph and the pursuit of the Duke of Habaxtal, who now has a name. So, Mike, I, I think there's lots for us to keep discovering here. So, what do you say next week to just a little more Patrick O'Brien? With all my heart. 
1747 when his young nephew, King Edward VI, is... is oh, 1547. Oh, what did I say? 16? Ah. You said 17. Oh, fuck, fudge. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Sam. Oh, gosh. Okay. 